let us left to us, we will rather totally forget about our civil war, but as human beings, it is beyond our ability to forget an event that was the defining moment in our political history. We shall continue to refer to those moments to learn lessons and reassess our current political activities and the question of national unity. To mark the end of our civil war, we cannot help but to remember the history of the civil war itself and the colossal loss of multitude of lives and property in our country. Our civil war started in 1967. Its origin is traceable to the 15th of January 1966 attempted military coup. Friday, January 15, was the day our nation woke up with the sad story of attempted military takeover by a few young Nigerian members of our military establishment. The known figures in that colors move by a few young people in military uniform wear, Major Chukuma Kaduna Nzegu, Major Don Okafo, Major Emmanuel Evergina, Major Chris Anuforo, Major Tim Omuwa Tegu, Major Humphrey Chukuka, Major Adewale Ademu Yegao, Captain Emmanuel Wobosi, Captain Ben Bulli, and Captain Oji, all of the Nigerian Army. Out of nine, out of ten, no, I'm sorry, ten out of ten actors in that event were of Igbo in extraction, and one from the Yoruba ethnic group. None from the north. And that that event cannot be sustainable. situation and murdered one of his wives along with him. Those who abducted Sir Abu Kataba Abulewa also abducted the then Federal Minister of Finance, Chief Festus Okoti Yebo, who was later murdered along with the Prime Minister Taba Abulewa. Brigadier General Zakaria Mayamalari was shot dead by Ifejina, who was his brigade Major, whom he stopped for a lift after escaping an attack on his house by the coup plotters. In that very fateful early morning, colleagues of those who abducted the Prime Minister also attacked the house of Chief SLA Akintola, the Premier of Western Region, and murdered him. As if that was not enough, the insurgents rounded up leading Nigerian military officers, including the house of Brigadier General Zakaria Memalari, Brigadier General Ademulegu, Colonel Yakubu Pam, Colonel Kuru Mohammed, and other senior military officers, and executed them. All the murdered individuals were from different parts of the country except the then Easter region. That was the story of that darkest day in our history. It was the event that opened the unfortunate chapter in our history, which leads to the series of events that brought about the civil war in Nigeria. Even though Major General Agui Irosi, 
thwarted the coup and became head of state. His actions such as making Nigeria a unitary state instead of the existing federal arrangement and his appointment of many Igbos into sensitive positions at the beginning of his regime, which caused the serious concern and specter of domination to people in the rest of the country, did not sit well with the aggrieved northerners still nursing the wounds of the elimination of most of their top military officers and government functionaries in January 1966. The July 1966 counter coup was bloodier than the first one and saw the death of 42 officers, mostly Igbo of Igbo origin. That and the killing of Igbos in some northern Nigerian cities, among other reasons, including some alleged bad blood between, said to be existing between the then military governor of Ito region, Colonel Odimoigu Ojuku and General Yakubu Kawan, the then new military head of state, led to the secession attempt of the Ito region of Nigeria and the subsequent civil war that started. Recall that during the last constitutional conference before our independence, a motion was tabled for the conference to insert a clause in our constitution for any section of Nigeria to break away from the country. The motion was roundly rejected by the delegates and the indivisibility of the Nigerian nation was enshrined in our constitution. Also recall that attempts were made mostly through the good offices of our leading figures and foreign friends to bring about peaceful resolution of the secession attempt. But such interventions were not successful. The result was the move by the then federal military government under the leadership of General Yakubu Gawan to embark on what was called police action to sustain the unity of the country, which resulted in three years of civil war to keep Nigeria one. As soon as the civil war was over, the federal military government introduced what it called three R's program. The three R's program meant reconciliation, rehabilitation, reintegration program. While some measures of success were were recorded in the implementation of the three R program due to human factors, some of the aspects of the program were not achieved speedily. But it is gratifying to note that our country has since achieved tremendous success in healing the wounds of the civil war and Nigerians are now living with one another in peace and harmony. People regarded as the main protagonists of that time, especially the Igbos and Northerners, are now living with one another as best of friends. There are many Northerners living in different parts of Igbo land today, while there are Igbos uh, found in every nook and cranny of Nigeria, particularly in places like Lagos, which is the foremost hub of economic activity in our country, and in the North, forming the largest number of non-indigenous inhabitants in the federal capital territory, Abuja, which is located in northern Nigeria. Despite this level of post-war progress, several burning political issues remain to haunt our political landscape. These include one, continuous call for a review of the 1999 constitution and the need to restructure Nigeria. Two, insecurity in different parts of the country arising from militant invasions and terrorist activities in the country. 
free the current secessionist movement for the state of Biafra under the umbrella of IPO over 50 years after the civil war was over and for the mistrust among major sub-regional groups which remain a threat to democratic process in our country. Lastly, we we'll need to learn lessons from the Civil War 51 years ago and address quietly the fractional tendencies in the country today. Unity, peace, trade, justice, democracy and development must be made to work for Nigeria to keep it one and stronger. We should tackle the issue by deliberately securing our next development plan and constitution to contain integration strategy as one of the major features of the plan. I thank you very much for your time and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start by paying my respects to uh, some great men who've passed away recently. There are many of them. I'll just name two. And that is Rear Admiral Ndubisi Khan. And of course, Onya Obi, who uh, is the son of Zetsi Obi, the, uh, the, the president of Igbo State Union, under whom my father, Dixon Kanu Ongwenu, DK Ongwenu, served as the principal secretary. There's a long history here. We're losing people who, are still, who have still so much to give to this country and so much direction to give to us. I'm almost tearing up and I don't want to. But I pray over all of us and I pray over this country that God will still have his way with us. This is a great country that we are all a part of and there's a reason why we've all been brought together. <clears throat> Excuse me. Having said that, I want to thank the organizers for having me last year. I, I didn't expect to be on this year. And in fact, I didn't want to. Because one of my principal problems with my people, Ndibo, is our lack of recognition and support for our women who happen to be the best in the whole world. We've proved that we can serve, we are committed, that we care and we love this country. Not just Igbo women, but Nigerian women in general. We have not been given our dues. We have not been given our place in the polity of this country. And it's really a waste. You do not go to war with one hand tied behind your back. And that's what Nigeria is doing. And if you don't know that we are in a war, please know it today. We are fighting on all sides. This is not the country that our fathers left for us. This is not what they wanted. This is not what was organized. A country that is rudderless. A country that does not care. Where the value of human life is totally diminished. A country where somebody can stand up and tell me that I have to be a slave, that I don't have a right to certain things because of where I come from. I say no. And that is where we stand. And I believe I've been listening to everyone. That is where we stand when we say, never again. Yes, we have not explored all that brought Biafra about. And I've listened to some of these speeches here and I cringe at the fact that not much has changed. We have learned nothing from our past experiences. And that is very sad. But what I can say to Nigeria, to Ndibu, the rest of Nigeria, the world is not waiting for you. I'd like to thank all of those people who have criticized and abused Ndibo. When somebody fights with his wife in their bedroom, it's the fault of Ndibo. I was disgusted with all of us during the NSAS tribulation, and it was a tribulation that our children were killed in front of us. What did we end up with? A strenuous effort made by people who should know to shift the blame for everything on Udibu. Hey, come on. We are no longer considered citizens of this country. When there's a problem, 
everybody unites behind hating Ndibo, be that as it may. I still have no apologies. God created me an evil woman. I am doubly blessed and doubly challenged, but that is why he put me here. And may he use every single one of us to achieve what he means, what he, he set this country up for. Let me round up so other people can have a chance to speak. Where do we go from here? Let me thank those that abuse other people. You encourage them. You make us stronger. You make us more determined. Because if you keep saying, go home, go home, we are going home. We're happy to go home. Did you well, go home? You didn't learn any lessons after the war, did you? Now you're back at it. And people, whenever there's trouble anywhere, everybody unites and asking you to go home. Please let us go home. Thank you for asking us to go home. You are making us go home because you don't know what is happening in Igbo, in, in, in the Igbo region now is that we're getting together to realize that nobody loves you. I'm not speaking about individuals here, please. I'm speaking generally. You're not wanted. So even if they don't, you're not wanted and they don't want to let you go, you can still go in many ways. Start taking care of your own problems. Start dealing with issues of food production, agriculture, development in every way possible. You are a people who are blessed just like everybody else. Never apologize for whom God has made you to be. Stand on it. Take it in the chin and know that you can make progress and show the world that this group of people can never be kept down. That the true Nigeria can never be kept down. Those who carry on as if they own the world and they own heaven. One day you will stand before the almighty king of kings and you will have to answer. Thank you all very much for having me. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, like others, I would like to also express my appreciation for um, being part of this uh, very important um, meeting. Um, and, I'm, and I'm happy that I'm speaking uh, uh, this late into the program because it has been a very rewarding two hours. I've listened to a lot of people. Um, uh, I'll be honest, I'm upset, uh, deeply upset because I've had the kind of voices that I thought um, we shouldn't be hearing at this stage. And uh, maybe it's a good thing that uh, the organizers picked the theme never again. It's we who should be reminded about never again, not the rest of the nation. We are more bitter now about the civil war. 51 years after the end of the civil war, we are more bitter about the circumstances, about what happened, what didn't happen, what versions of history we want to adopt, what version of history we want to throw away, uh, then, then we were five years after the Civil War. We finished this war in 1970. Within four years, virtually all the Igbo who had left the North, who were still alive, had come back to the North. They've taken up their lives. Northerners have moved to the East. Nigeria had moved on. Here we are 50 years, abusing each other, disputing the, the history. So, it's, it's a good thing that we are saying never again, but I think we need to recognize never what again. This is the elite, this is the cream of Nigeria. And we are speaking in a manner that suggests as if we're still fighting the war, which means this country has not made any progress. Certainly it hasn't been. Now history is very important. Virtually every speaker here has drawn attention to the fact we need to understand what happened. And there are many versions of this history and you can never get just one version. There will be many, many versions of this history. There's no problem with that. But let's agree on certain basics, even if we put a spin on some of them. In, in, there are many things Nigerians did well. The, every Nigerian got together and agreed that the British had to leave in 1960. That was a great achievement. It was achieved by Nigerians. We ran a government with all the problems for six years until the military came in and took away a democratic, democratically elected government. And they launched the country on a path of tremendous disaster, which went all the way until 1970. Now, you want to blame one part of the country, you want to blame the military, you want to blame the civilians, that's a different thing entirely. We need history, but we need to be careful. Our present and our future should not become captive of the past. 
If we do that, we will never fix the problems of today. We would always fight over what happened in the past. This is for me the most important lesson of what is going on now. We keep harping on what happened in the past. What do you do about now? What do you do about the future? How do we fix this country? How do you address the youth of this country? When we have fed on wrong information, misleading information, lies, alternative of realities, uh, we've created enemies for them they have no business having. So what do you do? How do you reinvent this country's history? How do you reinvent the future for this country? Now, for me, I think the starting point is to recognize the fact that the elite, the post-Civil War elite has substantially filled this country even far, even more than those who, who, who launched this country into the disaster that ended in 1970. So what do we need to do? I think we need to recognize the fact that as we speak, the year 2001, this nation has never been worse than it is, not even during the Civil War, not even during the Civil War. I'm sorry for those who felt the Civil War was the worst disaster. It isn't. Today is the worst disaster we're living. You have a, a, a very poor governance, a governor leadership that really doesn't care about Nigerians. You have massive insecurity. You have no, no fresh ideas. You have leadership that is more interested in having power than governing. You have complete vacuums. Leadership has retreated. Other, other leaders have retreated. All we do is insult each other, abuse each other. No one, no one is building bridges towards each other. This is the state of this country. And the way we are going, it's just going to get worse unless something dramatic happens. So we need to recognize the fact that when we say never again, it can happen again. Let's not kid ourselves. It can happen again. In fact, worse can happen. When people say, um, IPOP says, we, we don't want to be the Nigerians, some Biafran, we don't want to be Nigerians. They forget other country, other parts of the country also, there are many people who particularly are not keen about staying in Nigeria. It's not a big issue. There has to be a consensus that this country is worth saving, and it is, and we must work together. So the Nigerian state is very fragile, not just because the consensus around its continuation is weak, but because the elite who should work together are not working together. So we need to recognize the fragility of the Nigerian state. We need to adopt a sense of urgency and history. This is very, very important. We need to change the quality of leadership we produce all over. All over, we are on our knees now because we've made wrong choices in the, in the types of leadership that we elected. Politicians at all levels have no business being near power. So if we want never again to have to be actually never again, we need to revisit the process by which leaders emerge. We need to elect good leaders. Nigerians are fantastic people. We have the best, God has given us everything. We have no business living under the kind of leadership we're living now. So we need to take up two major gaps that exist. One, between the elites. You can imagine, there are a lot of people have been restrained in the way they talk now. <laughs> we know, because I represent one of the groups of the elites, we know when we sit down or when we, when, when we talk, we literally tear at each other. Now, who else is going to fix this country? Is it the same government that can't fix security? It can't fix the economy? It can't fix the youth? We can't, they cannot fix this country. So you need to close the gap between the elite. And you also need to close the gap between the elite and citizens. What do they, we need to do? We need to build bridges. Thank God. I mean, I wish President Obasanjo was here. I would have said to him, thank you, sir. Because there's an initiative he started, which is working now. It's bringing all these various groups together. And we're saying, put this nation on the table. And let's see what we can do with it. And we're being without, without questioning each other's qualifications to be there, we're without uh, all the bitterness that some of we uh, I, I heard now in the voices of some people. So we need to build bridges towards each other and we need to build the bridges that will reinforce the roots of this country. We need to adopt a positive attitude. This country can be fixed. This negative, cynical attitude that the nation has failed, um, I'm out, I'm, they, they don't like me here, they don't like, look, there's no country where everybody feels equally at home. There's none, but we need to adopt a positive attitude. We can fix Nigeria, we must fix Nigeria, because tempting as it is, those who think that if they leave this country, they, are, they will have peace, you're making a mistake. Nobody can leave Nigeria and live in peace. And I'm telling you the honest truth, nobody, we spent two months, we spent two days in, about two, um, in, 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 in the East, uh, the Northern Elders Forum, talking to Nigerian communities who have become victims of the uh, NSAS was um, uh, uh, violence. 
And then we met with thousands and thousands and thousands of northerners from all parts of the north. These were people who were born in the east, who would not leave the east for anything. We have thousands of their type in, in the north. So the, the roots of this country are very deep, but we are not as we are not recognizing that we need to adopt an attitude that says create a Nigeria for them. Create a Nigeria for these Nigerians who are all over the country who believe that it is worth taking a risk to live in another part of the country and to contribute to that community where you are and to feel at home. And this is very, very important. No one, no Nigerian must be made to feel second class, none. We must build a country of laws, not a country of, of ethnic groups, not a country of rulers and other people. We need to build a country. So we need to adopt a positive attitude. And it is very important, particularly among the elite. We can and we must fix this country. Then we need to integrate young people. It's amazing. I sat here for the last two hours. I've been reading religiously all the comments that have been coming in from people outside this meeting. It's unbelievable. I've closed to 90% of them are people who are insulting us. We don't want to hear, we want out, we want out, we want out, look at these people. Then the youth is entirely alienated. And I don't mean the, the youth from uh, the East or the West, our young are alienated. They don't feel part of this country. And we're not, not doing anything to integrate them. We're not doing anything to give them something to value in Nigeria. This is a terrible problem that we all have. What is, what is for them in this country? Look at what happened during the NSAS protests. Those are young people and they were fighting everybody, not just government. They were fighting generations up with the wrong generation. This is very, very important. So finally, we need to recognize the fact that Nigerian history is not all disaster. Nigerians have done tremendous things, including fighting a war and finishing it and putting it behind us. We have that the war is behind us. Let's not live in the war. We are not fighting that war again. We need to recognize all values, how our leaders collaborated, how they quarreled, but how they moved on. We need to create new values. This is a nation that can be great. It must be. No one, no one should assume that there is a future outside Nigeria. Thank you very much. The fact of the matter is that we can break away without any rancor or need to go to war. We mustn't forget that there was a country called Czechoslovakia. Today, they are the Czech Republic and um, Slovakia. They never fought any war. And for us to properly contextualize this never again theme or scenario that people are talking about, we must go back to how we were before the white man came. There was no war between Biafran people and the Duduwa people before Lugard came. There was no war between Biafran people and say the Fulanese from the North. Everybody minded their own business until the white man came and decided otherwise. Decided otherwise in such a way that even Igbo land itself is carved up into heaven knows how many states, even some of them in the North as we speak. My own relatives from a jaw land that we never fought any war with, decided all of a sudden that we are no longer together or should be one as a people. All of these things are the vestiges of colonialism. And I blame it squarely on the shoulders of those that call themselves the founding fathers of Nigeria. And after them, those of them that call themselves rather laughably the elites. You don't have elitism in a place where there is no running water, no good roads, no good schools. Cattle headers are busy slaughtering and massacring people everywhere. And some people have the temerity to come out on national television or on this forum to say they are the elite. Elite of what and for what? How, what have you accomplished? Absolutely nothing. So all this vacuous elitism makes me very, very sick. I do not subscribe to it. My main point that I want to raise is um, a brief response to what Tanko Yakasai said a while ago. There seems to be this blame game going on in Nigeria. And as the bishop quite rightly said, it is called, I think in his words from correct, he called it relativism. When a crime is committed by a Fulani, there isn't much who heard about it. 
if the same crime is committed by an evil person or by a friend, that seems to be an amplification of the implications of that very crime, regardless of how minuscule or irrelevant it may be in the wider scheme of things. Where am I saying this? You're telling me that you are in a country where the Fulanese have consistently been massacring people on a daily basis. First, they called them terrorists. Then they were called insurgents. And now they're called bandits. But you and I know that in the main, these are full and ahead as killing people. Nobody has ever suggested the designation of Mieti as a terrorist group. Absolutely none. You live in, in this sort of, um, um, under this climate, such as an atmosphere of impunity and lies. You witness these things every blessed day. And some people will have the guts or the temerity to talk about one Nigeria. Nigeria that came into existence only 60 years ago. How about the ethnic nationalities that existed before Britain was formed? The thing that we keep missing is this. Nobody has the guts to ever interrogate or challenge the deficiencies within Nigeria. And what do I mean by that? We never actually promulgated nor suggested any constitution in the first place. There is no Nigerian constitution. In other words, the ordinary public in Nigeria has no say in how they are governed. How then do you expect that country to move forward? How do you expect healing and reconciliation? How is that possible? You and I know it's never ever going to be possible. Yakasai and more northern commentators keep hopping on about the 1966 coup. It was an Igbo coup, which of course is a lie. I would recommend that Elder Tanko Yakasai go back and read Adam Yaga's How Why We Struck one of the people that he mentioned, he wrote a book, Why We Struck. In that very book, it was made explicitly clear that what happened in 1966 was a revolution. And I make bold to say this, without casting any aspersions or negating anybody, only the South can carry out a revolution. Only the South. Because of how the North is structured their mindset, the, the, the way they reason, their value system cannot allow them to rise above what I call very primordial religious sentiments to carry out a revolution or a coup against their leaders. What happened in 1966 was a revolution and in a revolution there are bound to be casualties. What Yakasai was alluding to is the fact that no Igbo high-ranking politician nor army officer was killed in the coup. But the fact of the matter is this, under Michael Okwara, we had the fastest growing economy in the whole of Africa, if not the whole of the world, 40% every blessed year. How can you kill such a person? The Sabana of Sokoto, Sama Dubelo went to San in London to go and give a speech in England, to go and give a speech. In that very speech, when he came into the hall, he segregated all the cadets, all the people, actually, the so-called Nigerians, at Sandhurst studying to become military officers. He said he wanted to address only the North. Only the North. Go and go through your history. They talk about history all the time. But these same elites are the same people that connived and conspired to deny us history in our schools because they understand the implications. That was what actually led the likes of Nzoku to say that these type of people should not be at the helm of affairs in Nigeria. I give it to them in the North. The North was going very well. So Ahmad Dubele knew what he was doing. The Fahab Balewa knew what he was doing. They all loved their people and they were developing at a very good pace, or should I say rate. But the fact of the matter is that there is nothing called one Nigeria. The sooner we rise up and face this reality better for us, or else our children and our children should be having these uh, discussions in years to come. And that is not the way to go. In Russia, there was a revolution by the Bolsheviks. In France, there was a revolution. In England, there was a revolution. Cromwell cut off the head of King Charles I. Today, you don't hear the royal family saying, oh, people from Cumbria, we are, um, 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 uh, Oliver Cromwell comes from, should be denied access to good education because they rose up against the crown. In America, there was a revolution. In every revolution, people are bound to die. The same thing happened in NSAS. During the NSAS protest, these same people introduced tribe and religion into it and falsely claimed that those burning down properties out of anger and rage because of the killings at Tollgate in Lagos are all evil people. The same people talking about one Nigerian to make Nigeria better. How is that possible? When people cannot be honest with themselves 
all of you, all of us participating today, we all know that the constitution is flawed. We know that the 1979 constitution or 19, in fact, from 79 to 99, they are all flawed documents. You and I know that. Because it's the turn of your village. You want to rotate presidency. You want to start eating as other people. You want to start buying houses in Dubai, in, in the UK and in America. You say, oh no, people not in my turn. That is what they're doing. Once you're elected as a senator, as a governor or whoever you are, you will say to yourself, not in my turn. Let me make that money that others have made before proceeding. You stay in a country, you are in a country where Omar Odiko is the most corrupt individual out of Africa. He's a funny man. The families are now enjoying the loot, the money he stole. There was a man called Ibrahim Tahir, if you have forgotten. This man burnt Nigel down at Marina after stealing all the money. And we are here pretending that somehow things can be better. It can never, ever be better. There is something called a referendum or a place beside. There Amazing. must be a constitution formulated by the people, and that is the best way to go without it. These discussions will continue forever and ever, and Nigeria will remain as poorly and as deprived as it is today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mazi. Before you go, please, there is a fundamental question that we would want you to address, sent in, that have you reduced the entire Fulani to headsmen who kill Southerners? Is it right? Is it fair to reduce all Fulanese to headsmen who kill? I am trying to pay them back in their own coin. Ojuku went to Aburi to negotiate for the same restructuring we are talking about today, going back to, to the regions. Every Igbo man in the north, every Biafran in the north, and to, to an extent some, some Yorubas as well, we are tagged rebels slaughtered and massacred in the north. What are the Fulani leaders doing about this space of insecurity and terrorism in Nigeria? Only the Fulani are responsible for ISIS in West Africa, for Boko Haram, for Ansaru, for all the, the so-called Fulani headsmen, sorry, the bandits that you have in the north. You have Fulani governors paying Fulani people to come to Nigeria to kill. A Fulani governor, I think the one from Bauti, openly said, we want to relocate all the Fulanis in the Sahel back into Nigeria. And we're here talking about one Nigeria, see if we don't have any brain. Do they think we are stupid? We cannot reason very well. We know what the end game is. The more the mouth unity, 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 it is to allow you to lure you into a false sense of security so that the Fulanis across the Sahel can come in to settle. Are you not aware of the speeches that the Kaduna State Governor made at the height of the slaughter of innocent people in Southern Kaduna? What did anybody do about it? Absolutely nothing. You did nothing. When they hastily tagged IPOB, a terrorist group, with no evidence, all of you kept quiet. Nobody did anything about it. No. But Miet Yala is busy negotiating with bandits, killing and raping people, and everybody is quiet. That but is why we no, are different. And Nancy. that is why we see that the Fulanese are in cahoots as to what is happening in the zoo. They want to take over the entire country and make it the home of Fulanese in West Africa. Go and do your research very well. You see it there. And Mazi, we are not going to allow it. It can't Mazi, Mazi, more Northerners are killed today. More Northerners suffer more from banditry than the South. So how do you explain that? In fact, now, the cry in the North is that we are insecure. So which negates this theory or thesis that the Fulanese are killing the rest of Nigeria? Who are the people being killed in the North, if I may ask you, please? Dela, my dear brother. Oh, Who are the people being Northern killed? Man. Where are the killings happening? Fairly they are happening in, in the Canyon in, in, in Kanuri Kansina. territory. We saw in Katsina the other day how many students were abducted. We saw in Brno the most popular one, the Chibok girls. So the North itself is not as if the North is enjoying peace. It is as a consequence of their own action. They underestimated the, the, how, how huge the problem will become in time to come. 
they fed this little python. They kept feeding it. They kept feeding it. And one day, the python turned around and started swallowing all of them. That's what they did. It is a consequence of terrorism. That is what actually happened. Once you spend years and years and years nursing and feeding terrorism, at a time it will come back to consume you. It is a natural consequence. It is a natural order. That is what they are suffering from. The true intent, the reason why they formed all these groups was to harass Jonathan out of office. That is a known fact. Nobody's denying that. They connived with Obama and all the rest of them. They planned perfectly to say that Jonathan was incapable of handling the situation in Nigeria. So a general has to come in. Tinubu on his part promoted that very false narrative. Only a general can save them because they we are impervious to all the indices that leads to and sustains terrorism. And today we have it. In Afghanistan, it's the same. Afghan people, they, they, uh, I wouldn't say that the Taliban is a terrorist movement, of course, they designated as such. But look at the Taliban in, 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 in Afghanistan. They started by killing occupying forces. And after a while today, you have um, Afghanis killing fellow Afghanis as a consequence of the climate of terrorism that is what happens all over the world. What is consuming the North today was what they themselves created. But some of us are too scared to speak the truth. The truth. Who brought terrorism into Nigeria? Let's be honest. El Rufai said it. We are paying bandits in Kaduna to stop killing people. Who brought them in? They did. A governor, a Fulani governor of Bauchi State said, we are seeking to resettle Fulanis into, are we deaf and dumb and so stupid we cannot reason properly? We are here talking about the niceties of constitutional change and reform and all the rest of it. They are not willing to do it. They understand the implications. Once you regionalize the governance of Nigeria, they understand that their stranglehold on the resources from my land that sustains that very contraption called Nigeria will slip away from their hands. And they do not want it. My anger is reserved for those who are complicit in the mess called Nigeria. They are complicit. Why are they complicit? They know the truth. You and I understand the truth. They have the solution to the problem. And somebody's telling us, oh, we the elites, we need to agree. Who are you? What elitism are you? From where? Who are you? It is the masses, the population that determines. It is called a republic for a reason. It belongs to the people. The people will rise and determine what, how they should be governed. Not a few you know, spent forces somewhere in Abuja discussing the fate of millions upon millions of people. I am a democrat at heart, and I want, if it is possible, if, had Nigeria been good, do you think I'd be agitating? These people, they buy houses in Dubai, they buy houses in England, is the man, people talk about presidency, regional presidency rotation, is the prime minister of England from, from Isekenesi, is the prime minister of England, is he an Uruguay man? But you prefer to buy houses in England. You go to Dubai, is uh, uh, the crown prince of Dubai or whoever is ruling Dubai, are they from your village? Are they from your village? But you will prefer, you will prefer to go and buy houses in Dubai than to buy a house, let's say, in Bauji, that you are in one Nigeria. I want to answer, uh, 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 there is more this question to, to, uh, to Kano, that this, is this Fulani that are killing people and are killing people? It is the Fulani, and I give you an answer. Fulani is the head man of here. When Otto said, these ass men who are killing me, I know them. This is their name. They have Messi uh, Allah. Uh, these are Fulani. What did you have, you have say? He said, go and make friends with them. You are all in the country. So when the Yahoo uh, said that it is Fulani, it is not the Fulani of uh, Sony. It is not the Fulani of... Uh, Colonel Umar is not the full idea of the, the exceptional full idea. It is the full idea of boring of of boring intellectual, for boring thinking that we are talking about. And you are talking of uh, we want to move forward. And can't go yet, as I say, we are now living in peace. Why? Because the whole passing of the custom is dominated by the casino and the north. Your president of the army by the north. Your president of the police by the north. And you say we are living in peace. It's an enforcement because we have no choice. And I want to say this. It doesn't support violence. 
I am one with Kanu. Why? I don't want this country to break. And as I've said before, I have contributed to the unity of this country before Buhari was born. In 1950, we have been talking of this balanced constitution. In 1979, I spent one year in my Duguri, campaigning for the UPS for a United country. I was already a lawyer. There was peace in the Western region. I don't have to go there. But why? We want the country to be together. So when people talk of United country, many of them don't, they have not contributed half of what I make in the, in the country for them before the result of the unity. And let me say this, if the, if, if, if the country today agreed to restructure the country back to federalism, you have signed the canoe, I have said it before, I have said it too. There will be no agitation from the basic people if there is true federal constitution where derivation is made, which you now call the um, um, resource control, all the trouble we are having now, all the problems we are having are the product of the imposed constitution. Let us face that. The moment you do this constitution to what you all agree to, there will be peace. There will be no ground for Canada to say we want to break away. As I often illustrate, if you are in a club, you are having a lot of advantage there, you make contributions there, you would like to get out. But when you are in the club where you feel cheated, you like to get out. For instance, when, when you are talking of equality, equality, you want the people to stay, and I've told them that. And as you say, the presidency is not, they are not entitled to the big bear for it. And why do you always refer to the North to concede to you? I object to that. And, that, and uh, my brother from this country, take note, the attitude of the presidency is selfish. The attitude to it is constitutional right. And that is why I am I am pressing and pressing that there should be a change of this constitution before any election. And I will be using the language, no, 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 no Nigeria is the bottom line. When I do this country, and she keep putting to the to the and they are having it is not the fact we agree to, it's the part they made themselves when they say the coup. All the pro problems of the coup, we all don't understand. But let us and let, let us have the courage now to tell our northern brothers who of who pretend like Takai Jako Yakasai that everything is all right because they are power, and then we tell you. So you can't have it without our consent. And people will now talk about you about if you do this, or the North will not agree. What gives the part of the North to agree to our country to, to that we're going to be in Nigeria? Why? It is inequality in the constitution. Which they made themselves. When you are on the table of talking about never again, I think never again is about never again. And then when we are discussing about never again, then people like Khan will come, people like uh, Onyeka come to say they want to go. Who is going to pet you to stop going where you're going to go? For crying out loud, we are all having issues in this country and we have come here to say never again. So no one has the monopoly of anger of wanting to leave. Every one of us has one or two or three or more issues that we are talking about. Please come on. Let's come off this thing of evils constantly threatening the whole country. They are going to go. They are going to go. When you have a child who is always telling you he wants to go, there is a day he will go and may come back like the prodigal son. Secondly, if we are here talking about never again, why do the Igbos always talk about uh, the North, the North? Must they refer to the North? Is the North their ruler or their controller? Please, let's go and reassess how we are going to stay together.
together properly and stop this victim mentality. I am from the middle belt. I am called that I'm a northerner. I have issues too, but please, when we come to talk and we join to all talk together, then some people now stick their necks out and start talking like ostriches and start talking also. It doesn't make us feel happy to come onto a platform that says never again. Please, I am stating this again. When we all come here to talk, we are trying to look for a solution. And everyone should come to look for a solution for a never again but not to come here and start threatening everyone. Nobody loves the Igbos. Nobody likes this. Nobody wants them. So they are going to go. If you go, what's going to happen? Will heavens fall down? Nothing will happen if you go. I thought we we're here to find out how we will move on. You stay in a country, you are in a country where Omar Diko is the most corrupt individual out of Africa. He's a funny man. The families are now enjoying the loot, the money he stole. There was a man called Ibrahim Tahir, if you have forgotten. This man burnt Nitel down at Marina after stealing all the money. And we are here pretending that somehow things can be better. It can never, ever be better. There is something called a referendum or a place beside. There Imagine. must be a constitution formulated by the people, and that is the best way to go without it. These discussions will continue forever and ever, and Nigeria will remain as poorly and as deprived as it is today. Thank you very much.